So Brian today is, um, he's got a slightly different title from the one that's in the, uh, the abstracts, um, but it's on the same, the same theme. He's put it up there, so I don't need to read it out. So um, I'd like to introduce Brian Smith. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, um, Andrew, and thanks for the invitation. Um, I said originally that I was going to speak about two accounts of fishing disasters. I'm only going to speak about one, but an exceptionally important one. One day in 1931, a manuscript arrived at the Shetland News Office in Lewick. It was unsolicited and it was of the greatest interest to the editor, my friend the late Mortimer Manson. Charles Manson, an old man in Hooland in North Row, had sat down to write an account of a Wednesday night that he'd spent at sea in a six-oar boat 50 years previously when he was 19. Johnson doesn't seem to have written anything else up till that moment, but he'd been brooding about the events and results of that night in his youth. We have experienced worse, he wrote, heard and read of as bad and worse, but this summer night of 1881 sticks to me more than any of the other happenings. Why, I don't know. Now, Johnson's essay is a wonderful <coughs> piece of writing, one of the best ever written about a ship on subject. It's vivid and touching, and I'll be quoting his own words as often as possible this morning. Mortimer Manson prepared it for publication in his firm's Shetland Almanac and Companion for 1932. He deliberately retained Johnson's grammar and spelling, and he told me many years later that he was scolded for doing so by Joseph Gray, a local author of slapstick tales. Gray said that Mortimer had and I quote, let Johnson down. In fact, Mortimer never did a better day's work. Now before I deal with Johnson's essay in detail, I'll show you the area of where he and his colleagues were based, and where they fared from and to on the evening of the 19th to the 20th of July in 1881, when 60 Shetland fishermen died at sea, as Terry uh, mentioned this morning. It's a sparsely inhabited coastline on the northwest of Shetland's mainland. It contains five small creeks where boats, crews could operate and find shelter. The South Week of Oya, uh, where Johnson and his colleagues were based, Sandvo, uh, the Blade of Heller, uh, Hamnevo, and the Min, uh, their Stennis. I've mapped other places too, the Ossa, the Isle of Oya, the Ramnestax, and the Otran Heads, landmarks, <coughs> or even fatal places, if you came there in bad conditions. It's also important to understand the boat in which the crew went to work, and which took them back to land. She was a sixer, we've heard about these uh, boats several times uh, during the conference, 30 feet long, one of the biggest of its day, with a crew of four men and three boys uh, wielding eight oars. This diagram by the late Ian Morrison uh, shows you how its small space was divided out up for work. The crew had a small amount of equipment, six miles of fishing lines, with a hook at each fathom already baited, a compass, a buoy, oil skins, some cooking equipment. The skipper had a watch in his pocket. And it was with these few accoutrements in that small boat that Johnson and his comrades set off early in the morning of the 19th of July. They rode for nine hours until they were 30 miles from land. We shut out six lines northwest by north, Johnson writes, which would reach close on six miles and run down on 96 fathoms water. We had a feed which took less than an hour and commenced to haul. We got fish at once, very large ling, 
we had got 180 ling with a scatter of other fish which filled the boat shop level with the toft. Now the first thing to notice about Johnson's account is that he writes as a youth of 19 on his first season as a man in an offshore boat, as he puts it, rather than as an elderly man of nearly 70. He conveys the system of subordination in the boat based on age and experience to perfection. It's a remarkable reconstruction. Three of the older men was our leading men, he says. Us other four did not interfere at any time. When the back of wind came that inaugurated the storm, he asked them, is this a change? They did not answer me. And at no time during the following nine hours did he speak again. Nobody said much. When the storm struck, the skipper turned to a colleague, a man who himself had been a skipper, and, and I quote Johnson again, asked him what he had to say about this. Making for the land now, the second man replied, we will come there in the darkness. These men was cool, says Johnson, and spoke the matter over. And Johnson pondered what the discussions meant. The good man who mentioned the land in darkness, he concluded, did not mean that we were to stop where we were. His system, when in difficulty with his boat, was get underway. Johnson was writing after years of sea experience that he, re re he recreated the situation when he had next to none, the moment when he was learning. <coughs> so they cut the fishing lines and they headed towards land. We put up the mast and she commenced her race, says Johnson, and from now on the boat herself becomes an actor in the story. I, for one, was glad when the lines were cut and the boat got her freedom. Put her to do what's right and then she will do it. It's no use putting her to what scene is too much to the last chance. It was 9.30 p.m. The three men who were managing the boat, says Johnson, did not pass any remarks to us nor to one another they appeared to be quite contented and fairly understood what they were doing, but there was a huge task ahead of them. There would be wild steering, he says, when the water was going over the boat and flooding the glass of the compass and no suitable place for it in front of the man steering. And from now on, Johnson's account becomes technical and didactic. First of all, he deals with the water that inevitably came on board during the race to land. The situation was complicated by the fact that there was a ton of fish there already and 600 weight of what he calls non-market fish. So his explanation about that problem is exemplary. I would like some people to understand, he says, what water in a boat means. These open boats had no bulks head across them. Having that would not work, I suppose. What they had was open grating between the rooms or compartments so that water could pass almost at will from aft to forward or vice versa. Say a boat has an empty shot and she ships a sea and partly fills the shot in the owl's room. She lifts aft well and all seeks for it to the lee bow. Say this happens with a shot half full of fish. It's not so easy bailing water mixed with fish. Then every time the boat rolls, the water rolls with her. So in a heavy sea, we're up to the boot tops at the knee, knowing that that's in the house room, and even with only a little in the mid room, that was as much as I wanted to see. Yet she would not be quarter full. And meanwhile, he was watching the skipper, because once the lines were cut, he and his junior colleagues had little or nothing to do. It was now between 11 p.m. and midnight. Johnson's account of the skipper's tactics and the hazards that he met five decades later 
is so accurate that I think he must have had a photographic memory. I noticed the stepper run the seas in the weakest parts, what we call the tails, sometimes the first tail, but he often got along to the last tail. Only once did I notice him having to run a sea in the center. This sea rose very high astern. They pressed her with the sail when the surge came round her, and although the sail was laid down, she ran in it for a bit, like a field of snow, and took water over both sides. It was not good to look at, but it was only a look. Almost that self-effacing, minimizing tone. Johnson doesn't make a fuss about the danger they were in. She could not have stood much of that, he says. She took the water from the mast aft to the hours room, so it came only in the mid and hours room, and was not a lot, but we were standing on the bottom to the boot tops in the hours room. The water could not get aft through the fish. The fish dammed it for it. I'd been brought up with boating since I was a child, but this, of course, was a bit extra. <laughs> Self-effacing again. The greatest danger came when they approached land. The skipper didn't say what he was thinking. The crew had to guess where he was heading. They reckoned that he had in mind the South Lake of Oya, their home port, or Rennie's Vaux. Missing any of these two ports might be fatal, said Johnson. They might be wrecked on the Ockran Heads. It wasn't so dark now, but there was still room for confusion. The crew thought that they could see the Isle of Oya and told the skipper so, but in fact it was the Ossa. The skipper needed to know for certain, and eventually he took a chance. He brought the boat round so that he could look himself to leeward past the sail, <coughs> sail and the mast. He had just got well up, said Johnson, when a sea made, as usual in such cases. They gave her the sail or more sail. He did not run that sea. It was too close on us. He just kept her going. The last tail struck her from the mast and aft. She lay down to this, in other words, she was engulfed. That's the sail. She had no high sight to receive a big knock. It's the only time she's laying down to it since we started. She was submerged by the sea came. I lost sight of the man in the house room and the skipper, and as it passed over her, he rather kept her away, and the sail was eased. And at that point, Johnson took a look over the bows, and she was like running over a precipice. But the worst was over. His account of their arrival in port is a marvel of calm writing. The skipper, he said, kept on for the east side of Ronnie's bow in case he might have to run a sea. The sea was very bad on both sides of the entrance. The west side was the worst. It's the most rocky side. When we got inside the heads, he drew into the center of the entrance and headed on towards the blade of Heller. We seen there was a lot of boats there. We came in about and tied up. We got out. The skipper having a watch told us it was 1.30 a.m., four hours running in. <coughs> we were nothing the worse. We had not been afloat 24 hours. We had not completed a night's non-rest. Two, we had pulled offshore the day before, but in our mind that was just an awful <coughs> day's work. Johnson wasn't being naive or falsely modest about his experience. I, for one, he said, thought it was as bad or the worst we could have come through and live. There's no doubt that his account, written five decades after the event, is the finest piece of writing about open boat fishermen, their work described in the most complex detail and its hazards. Others wrote about the storm. In Edinburgh, the author Jesse Saxby, who we've heard about this morning, the daughter of the Shetland landed family, sat, sat down to offer advice to Shetland fishermen and contributed it to the Scotsman. Saxby 
was alarmed to hear that some Shetlanders were getting fed up with their traditional open boat and its unsafe operation. They were impressed by the deck boats that were appearing around the islands as the Scottish herring boom arrived here. And this is what Jesse said. A better seaman never steered a vessel than the late Dr. Hamilton of Bresser, and I have heard them frequently say that no boat was more likely to survive in a storm than a well-found Shetland Sixer. He proved it himself again and again by carrying his little craft across white water, which would have swamped many a larger boat of different build. Dr. Edmondston of Unst, uh, Jesse's father, was of opinion that the six of them floated when more ambitious but less buoyant barks went down, and that few of any six of them had ever found it out at sea. Dr. Edmondston often exhorted the men to keep off the land and trust to their boats at the far half when a sudden storm came on. On various occasions they did so, and they returned in safety two days, perhaps later, when others who had sought their islands panic-stricken had been lost in sight of home. Now, we don't know what the panic-stricken or incompetent Shetland crews, as Mrs. Saxby went on to style them, thought about her pronouncements. But John Leask from South Shields, an expatriate Shetlander who'd been a fisherman, gave them a short shrift. <laughs> Continuing the discussion in the Shetland Times, he wrote witheringly, I do not for one moment dispute the ability of Dr. Hamilton or Dr. Edmondson in conducting a sixon over either white water or black, but I should like to know how many gales they have personally rowed out at the far half with a close reef sixon, which enabled them to give such practical advice to their less experienced brother fishermen. We know he went on that ladies, ministers, and doctors are all useful members of society, and we owe a tribute of gratitude to them for their advice and ability, but as a general rule, they are not the class of people who have to go down to the sea in ships to earn their living on the great highway of the nations. And I believe that whoever advises our fishermen to continue their old method of fishing is no friend of the Shetland fishermen. So I return to Charles Johnson. He, re he remained an enthusiast for the Sixth Seven. In 1939, Mortimer Manson published a vigorous posthumous defense of it by him. But Johnson didn't participate, as far as we know, in the controversies after the July 1881 storm. Instead, he began a lifetime of thinking about that night and other nights at sea and their outcomes. And that's the subject of the second half of his essay. He was anxious to celebrate the good men who did and didn't get back on the morning of the 20th of July, 1881. He was particularly interested in the fate of one boat from the island of Yell. She seemed to have been making for the mouth of Yelsund that came ashore at the north wick of Boya. On board was the corpse of Alec Moore from Colavo, tied to the boat with some of her rigging. Johnson and his colleagues took up a collection to pay for the man's funeral and put a wooden board long gone on his grave with a narrative about how he had met his fate. Why had Moore tied himself to the boat? Adam Hackerow, writing in the 1940s and discussing Johnson's account in detail, thought about the group boat too. He concluded that Moore, the last man of the crew living, yearned for a Christian burial and, as Hackerow puts it, pulling as much as he could of the now slack shroud towards him, bound himself to the gunnel. The body, said Johnson, who apparently saw it, was just lying in a reclining position in the house room <coughs> where the shrouds is set on. Charles Johnson and his colleagues didn't laugh playfully at the threats of a menacing ocean. 
I suspect that Adam at Bremen's view on that subject are as valuable as Jesse Saxby's. They were very serious about such matters. But there's more to it than that. It has often been said that Shetlanders were cowed on land but fearless when they got to sea. At sea, they didn't give a thought to landowners and merchants, the political economy which agitated them a great deal at home. They dealt with their maritime problems carefully and calmly. They weighed up chance and what, thought, what they thought might be fate in their daily lives. And I end with a quote from, a final quote from Charles Johnson. I could give more details about Alan Moore's boat, he concluded, but this may do, and if I am right in this good man making for Yelsund, I think he did a very wise thing and was surprised that more of the glue boats did not do the same. And although this one did not get through, others might, and was likely to be all right. So what I think is that this man did not misbehave in any way, but played his part well, like others, but just like others, it had not to be. Thanks. Very, very soon after the 1881 disaster, the Sixth uh, was abandoned. So Jesse Saxby's views on the subject uh, were not relevant, um, as we might have expected from the way that she wrote. Um, the, um, Charles Johnson was an enthusiast, as I said, for the Sixth Army, but uh, actually, uh, after his initial career at sea in a, in a Sixth Army, also in the Haddock book, um, he became a barman in Newcastle and uh, subsequently in the Turks Head uh, bar in Lerwick. Um, so he, you know, he was flexible too. Um, yes, very good talk, Brian, and very, very interesting. The, uh, the Saxby and others romantic notion of the Sixery Anybody who knows anything about the sea knows that the deck boat is inherently more seaworthy than an undecked boat. And there's a lot of, I mean, six rings are beautiful craft that absolutely had their limits and, and a lot of nonsense talked about them uh, in terms of being wonderful sea boats. I mean, any boat with a deck of water won't come on board. The point that she was making, I think she referred to Edmondson's point about staying at sea and not coming ashore, I have heard that in terms of the early Icelandic fleet, that when storms came, the Icelandic open boats, if they could, would stay at sea, uh, because their view was as they came close to shore, then uh, there was a real difficulty, the weather would be worse, more waves as the water got shallower, and uh, the conditions would be worse closer to shore. Probably also related that along much of the Icelandic coast, there aren't the creeks and bows that there are in Shetland. It's more an open coast. So I have heard that. So uh, yeah. Edmondson might have had a point there. Yeah, it, I mean, it was discussed this point, but there seemed in this correspondence to be a, an agreement that um, if you stayed at sea, and a storm could, of course, go on for more than one day, that exhaustion and uh, exposure might uh, lead to death just as much as the danger of coming to shore. Um, there's also the point I th that I think we can deduce from Johnson's accounts and from other accounts that the skill of these Shetland half skippers was so great, and we see a, a perfect example of it there, that they believed that they could do that uh, return trip to land effectively. 
Yeah, just uh, very interesting, Brian, and check with John's comments. I mean, I'm no expert, obviously, but I think there is a general belief, you know, that it's easier to ride out a storm at sea. But, you know, the points you make about succumbing to exposure, I, I think, in an open boat are, are, are well taken. So it's obviously a, you know, a gamble for the fishermen. Do you try and get into a safe haven or not? The other comment I was going to make, it's very interesting hearing what Jesse Saxby and others had to say. And, and to be honest, although it's not publicly stated, there is still a tendency even today for people in authority to try and dictate or tell fishermen how and what kinds of boats that they should be using. And there's still this romantic view that, that oh, well, fishermen should go back to using small boats. Uh, you know, but, but it's, it, it's, it's a kind of view that is, is detached from, from reality. And basically you're saying you've got to go back to using more primitive, less safe vessels. And these are people who, who know no more about the sea than Jesse Saxby did. Yeah, exactly. John Goodland told me a very amusing story yesterday, which John, you might repeat uh, for us today, um, about the fisheries officer. <laughs> yes, uh, in, the, in the archives, in I was reading the fishery officer's report from, I think it was the 1870s, and here was a fishery officer uh, tucked in his nice warm office somewhere in Levy, making the point that the smack fishermen that I spoke about yesterday, quad smacks, they went to Faroe and they went to Iceland, but they didn't go to Rockall very often. And in his opinion, they didn't go to Rockall. Uh, uh, he didn't know why they didn't go to Rockall. It may have been, quote, for want of pluck. <laughs> Charlie, and then. Yeah, you have to be careful, Brian, when you say shipment abandoned the six of them, because it took nearly 25 years after 1881 before the last six of them was working. So there was a, to some degree, there was a conservatism that, that allowed the thing to taper away into extinction rather than just a, an abrupt abandonment. Yeah, no, I, I didn't mean to imply that it was as abrupt as that, but I mean, there's no doubt at all that these decades contained the, you know, the, the moment that the six of them became unpopular. Which coincided with more technology than the show say the deck boats. Yeah. You can also draw a distinction between a weather show or a lee show. Because the main in Johnson's area were coming in on a lee show. Uh, whereas on the east side of Shetland they were being blown away to leeward. Uh -huh. And the length of time that you could survive in a six or nine storm I think was totally critical. Because the men on the west side did not. I don't think anybody would have made an attempt to stay at sea to the northwest of the ship on the mainland in a, in a hurricane. Their only chance to survive was to reach land say. On the east side of Shetland, when men were in danger of being blown across the North Sea, we have the accounts of, for example, the Hitler sections who beat the sections into the face of that gale for half a day and more to try and sail up to the land. And more often than not, when they got to the land, there was usually somebody made of the exposure by that time anyway. John, Johnson actually wrote an article in 1935 about the 1887 um, Hannibal disaster, where, where he was also uh, a participant. But he argued very strongly that um, oil skins were absolutely crucial to the survivability of the trip of that. And that if these guys didn't get their oil skins on, they were often a gone. I know there's more questions, uh, but I think we'll stop for, for coffee now. And if you've got questions for Ryan, you can wait on the way to the coffee.